Father, we come before you grateful for your Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Eternal. You are the Father <clears throat> in character and likeness and word and deed and all things. You and the Father are one. There is no division between you. We thank you that the Holy Spirit likewise will not turn to the left or to the right or go any other way but your way to fulfill all that is written, to honour you and to uphold you. We know that everything that does not uphold you is not of you. So Lord, we ask and pray that you would sanctify us, be jealous for the blood of your sacrifice, be jealous for your name concerning us, that you would deliver us out of the hand of your enemy and ours, that you would deliver us from the world, that you would set us free from the power of sin, that you would keep us from deception, that you would heal us, Lord, of the injury caused by being in the world, and that you would give us grace, wisdom, and power, Lord, to not injure others, but to be gracious in the truth and in the power of your presence to do good, to do holy, to do righteous, to do all that a disciple ought to do. We pray for those who are not here, Lord, for their various reasons. We lift up Maurice to you. We ask you, Lord, to really cleanse her of all that is making her sick and to bring her, Lord, onto really solid ground. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would teach her and instruct her where she is, Lord, that you would bring her quickly back to full health. We pray this also for Brother Pete, who's still in hospital. Even though his time among us might be short, we thank you that we will see him again. But I ask, Lord, that you make his time remaining, Lord, free of the pain from that cancer, Lord, that you would help him to endure and have a great witness, that you would comfort him, that you would grant him your shalom. We pray, Lord, for Dee, who's celebrating her mum's birthday with her right now. We ask, Lord, that you be with them and bless them. We thank you for her mum, who's been a, a faithful witness for you in Dee's life all the days of her life. We ask you, Lord, to comfort her this time. Without her husband there at her side, Lord, she'll be sorrowful, Lord, but you, you are a husband to widows. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would husband her, that you would bless her and lift her up. For all the sick, for all the lonely, for all the injured and the scattered and those who have no one to guide them home, we pray and ask, Lord, that you would stretch out your right hand and gather them up to yourself and bring them back from wherever they've been sent. And the truth and love and mercy and under the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, have a seat. <coughs> You're okay, Maya. Yeah. Okay, do I need the do I need the microphone or can you hear me all right? Yep, okay, let's try that. So tonight we're going to uh, begin and look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 has quite a few parts to it. So you'll see that tonight, probably to your great relief, it's only four pages because I didn't want to start on the next part of Matthew, Matthew 9 or else it would have to be suddenly like eight pages. So uh, a, night, a, a short one tonight, but lots in it. So, we're coming up to Passover. Who can tell me why we didn't do anything at Easter? That's right, because Easter has very little at all to do with Christianity. It's slightly off topic, but can anyone remember where the name comes from? from Ishtar, okay, that's one of the principal pagan goddesses. So it's got a pagan name. What about the character of Easter? What's in it that's Christian? Anything? Basically, virtually nothing. Easter eggs, bunnies. Are they in the Bible? Quickly look up an Easter egg in the Bible for me. Good luck trying. But they are part of pagan, European pagan worship for the spring uh, celebration of their, their spring equinox. What about, here's one for you, hot cross buns. 
pains me to say it since I really like hot cross buns. Pains me to say it, but they're incredibly pagan. Are they in the Bible? Well, they are. Where they are forbidden. That's right, it's forbidden as well. But I'll point out that hot cross buns, which most especially unsafe people associate with Easter, oh, I'm a bit Christian because I eat hot cross buns, is the very thing, something that's actually forbidden. Gets translated in your Bible as raisin cakes made for the Queen of Sheba. Okay? What's wrong with a hot cross bun compared to Passover? It's bread, right? What does the bread for pa Passover have to be? Unleavened. Unleavened. Hot cross bun is got yeast in it, isn't it? It's big, fluffy. Yeah. And it shouldn't have any, it should be just water and flour. What's in a hot cross bun? Spices, fruit, all of that in the Old Testament is associated with pagan the worship of pagan goddesses, okay? So your hot cross bun is like pagan worship in a bag. So Easter is an absolute loser for if you want to be a real Christian, to be avoided like the plague. What about the sermon stuff they teach in church at Easter? Is that okay? Well, of course, depending on who's giving the sermon. But for the most part... That part's okay, but it gets lost in the sea of Easter eggs and everything else. Because if you go to most churches on Easter, what do you think they're doing? They're hunting eggs. Yeah, they're handing out Easter eggs, aren't they? <laughs> Everyone look under the seat, your Easter egg is there in church. And then you'll have hot cross buns at morning tea. So the message gets lost in all the other rubbish. <coughs> so, quite often though, isn't the right message anyway. Well, that's right. That's why I said depending on who's giving the sermon. So, for the most part, Easter has been so completely hijacked by the pagan world that you're better off having nothing to do with it. So, we're coming up to Passover, and usually, what would we be doing? We would be reminding ourselves of the Old Testament things that Passover is about, which point to the New Testament. Can you, I know it's been a while, but can you dig deep into your memory and remember some of those Old Testament things to do with the first Passover that tell you about Jesus? Can you remember any? Or, what, or if you can't remember that, about what happens in, at the end of time at the, in the book of Revelations. Is there any connection to that? Well, but they, they had to slaughter a lamb in the Old Testament. To slaughter a lamb, yep. Which points to the slaughter of Yeshua on the cross. How do we know that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, to be the Messiah, he has to fulfill the law and the prophets he has to be the fulfillment of what those rituals only point to right so passover revolves around the the lamb what did god say and we're going all the way back to um Gen uh, exodus 6 the first passover what did god say to do with the lamb can have no defects how does that point to jesus He's without sin. No blemish, no defect, no fault, no sin. What must, how do you know it's got need, no defects? What has to happen to the lamb? Has to be inspected for defects. Does that happen to Jesus? How? Who inspects him? The Sanhedrin, Herod, and Pontius Pilate. What does that represent? The priests, the secular authority, and the Gentiles. None of the three authorities in the land could find any fault with him. So the lamb is inspected. Then, he, at 
when the sun goes down, the lamb should be killed. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? When, when did Jesus die? Middle of the day, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but what happened when he died? It went very dark. It went dark. Okay. So by Hebrew reckoning, a day is between dark and dark. So on that day in the Hebrew calendar, there's two days. They would reckon that as the end of the day. So he meets that test. What do you do with the lamb? You roast it and then eat it. You have to eat it. Where? Inside the house. Can't eat it anywhere else. And who eats it? The whole family, the whole members of the household. How do you eat Jesus? Are we cannibals? No. You digest his word. Yes, that's it. You take him into yourself. How do you do that? You read, study, and understand the gospel and take aboard Christ. You feed on the word, you take him into yourself to be, become more like him. Okay. What else happens to the lamb? How about the house? If he's the lamb of God, why is it the lamb of God, by the way? Because he's come from the Father. Something more than that. That's true, but it's something more than that. Each household has to have a lamb, yes? So if we're at the Cabral house, and who picked the lamb? Mary Lou? Definitely not. It's got to be Jerry. It's the father has to choose the lamb for the household, right? Has to be the father for his household. Okay? So the lamb at their place is the, is the lamb of the Cabrals. What's the lamb of God? It has to be the lamb that the father chose and if he chose it what household did he choose it for his so the lamb of god is the passover lamb for god's people not for anybody else god's what are you supposed to do when you've killed the lamb something to do with the house Take a bit of hyssop oh, about, yeah, and you dip it in the blood. Yeah? Yep. And <coughs> is there a pen? Ah. So, you, where do you. Here, here's a door, and it's got two posts and then a big lintel across the top. Okay? And the door's in there. It doesn't say just chuck it anywhere. It's really specific. Where are you supposed to put the blood of the lamb? On the door posts and on the lintel. So if I draw that over here, that is the letter Tav in Old Hebrew. By the time of Jesus, speaking Aramaic, Hebrew had changed. Can anyone tell me how to write the letter Tav in, by his time? Like that. Recognize this symbol? Where did the blood of the lamb go? On that. To be a Christian, you have to take up your own cross. You have to die to this world. To enter the kingdom, you have to enter through the cross. The cross, picking up your own cross, is going through the door into the house of your father. The blood of the lamb is on the door. And Jesus himself is the door. You can't enter in but by him. Okay, By following him. He went first on the cross. You have to follow. So he passes that. Incidentally, You'll get Christians who always talk about the blood of Jesus covers us. Is that strictly right?
People love to talk about the blood of Jesus covering us. Is that strictly right? <clears throat> blood of Jesus covers you clean. But Specifically right, because it, it, there's a bit of a trap in this. Where's the blood on the building? I just told you, on the building. It's not on the people. So to be protected by the blood on the building, where did you have to be? In the building. How do you be in the building on which the blood of Christ is? What did Jesus say? Remain in me. If you keep my teaching, you remain in me. If my words remain in you, I will remain in you. Being a disciple is how you remain in God's house. It's not a building, it's remaining in Him. That's the only way to be under the blood, is to be in the house. The blood doesn't cover individuals, it covers His household. So yet people think that they're wearing some kind of bulletproof vest. Oh, the blood of Jesus covers me. Well, only if you're really a disciple by virtue of the fact that you are counted by God as being in his house. Why did you need to be in the house that night? To avoid being killed. So that you didn't come under what was happening outside. What was happening outside? The angel of death passed over the land of Egypt and killed the firstborn of everything. Right? What's important about the firstborn? It's supposed to be dedicated to God. Only if you're a Jew. What, is, what was God doing to them? What about Pharaoh? Pharaoh's son died. When Pharaoh's son died, what died with him? His line. You know, your future. The future of your family name. It's that idea. Were you allowed to go out? If you're in the house, were you allowed to go out? What was the instruction? Go in, eat the pastor in there, and remain there until morning. If anyone goes out, they are not covered. Remember what we've been saying about how it's possible, it's not easy, but it's possible to lose your salvation if you leave. God will never leave you, but you can leave him. The Passover equivalent is you leaving the house during the night. Oh, I'm not staying in here, I'm bored, I'm going out. The blood covers the house, not you. If you go out, you're not covered anymore. What happens to backsliders? Are they still covered by the blood? No. If they leave the faith, they are no longer covered. What about... We talked about um, what was happening outside. That was a plague, wasn't it? What number? Ten. It's number ten. What's the one immediately preceding it? Darkness. Darkness came over the land, right? If you look in the book of Revelation, guess what happens? When the judgments are poured out, they repeat what happens in Egypt. And the last one is darkness. There's no light. The gospel is gone. The Christians are gone. It's utter darkness. The Antichrist is completely in charge. And then judgment. Everything repeats at the end. What about the lamb? Someone mentioned you couldn't break any bones. Can anyone remember why not? That's from Psalm 22, I think it is. When you do, when you, if you go to a Jewish household for uh, Pesach, Passover, there is a whole set of scripture gets read because this goes on for hours, right? There's a thing called the Great Halal. The halal is um, Hebrew for praise, so it's the Great Praise. Okay, it begins Psalm 22 and as it goes through Psalm 118. So lots of it, all speaking about Messiah. 
in there it speaks that it talks about the Lamb of God that none of his bones will be broken right and what happened to Jesus well keep it simple what happened to the prisoner either side of him they had their legs broken. Why? Because it makes them die quicker. Yeah. Because you, do you know how you die on a cross? Suffocation. Suffocation. Because you can't, the, with your whole weight hanging off your armpits, your chest muscles can't pull your diaphragm up to breathe. Okay, so you sort so, of so drown. What happened to Jesus? None of his bones are broken. Why? Because he's the Passover lamb. Okay. Is that just something cute God thought up? What, would it, what might it mean? What do the bones represent? Anyone have an idea? Very close. Jesus himself is the Vara Adonai. Okay? He's the word in person. He's the word in the flesh. What do we know about the word of God? It doesn't change. Right? It never falls over. It never goes floppy. What stops the body, what stops your body from being all floppy? What holds it up? You're a skeleton. Okay? Yeah. The bones refer to God's law, his ordinances, his word, that keep his body, his people, upright. Jesus, personifying the whole word of God, he couldn't, none of that could be broken. You know, as a symbol, he couldn't, that framework, if you like, that holding his physical body up has to be intact because it points to the fact that the framework of who he is, the word, is unbreakable. Does that make sense? How about the, what else happens at the Passover meal? Let's do this for a couple more minutes, just to remind you. So you have the lamb. What else do you eat? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. Yeah. What's that? It's um, haretz, isn't it? Yeah. Um, why bitter herbs? Why do you eat bitter herbs? It's to remind you of the bitterness in which you lived as slaves in Egypt. Okay. What else do you eat? You have four cups of wine, okay? Two of which are mentioned in the gospel, but they would have had them all because it's Passover. Because God said Passover is a feast you must observe throughout your generations forever. Okay, so Passover never stops. Incidentally, what are they remembering at Passover originally? So if it's like, let's say it's like 50 BC and it's Passover, what are they gathering to remember? <coughs> Escape from Egypt. So it's all about to remember how God brought them out of being slaves to Pharaoh. You know, miraculously through the, through the sea and all that, parting the waters, all that, right? We're supposed to do that, God's people are supposed to do that, throughout their generations forever so that includes now but Jesus changed something when they're having Passover what did he say to his disciples and he does it when he's about to drink offer a cup of wine which is the cup of thanksgiving he says from now on has it finished from now on, do this in remembrance of me. What's he saying? Nothing's changed. But now you know what all that was always all about. It was always pointing at what you're about to see happen. So next year at Passover, don't think about Egypt anymore. Think about what God did through me. That's what he's telling us. So when we do Passover, that's what we're to do. We're not look, to look back to God bringing the Egyptians out of, bringing the Egyptians, bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. We're to look back at what that pointed to, where God made a way through his lamb for slaves to Pharaoh. Who's that? 
Well, who does Pharaoh represent in the picture? Satan. So when you were slaves to sin, you were, you were slaves to Satan. God made a way for you to be rescued out of his kingdom through the blood of the Lamb, Passover all over again. What else do you eat? We talked about it a second ago when we were talking about hot cross buns. You eat unleavened bread, matzah. And remember, there's three matzah. And they sit in a linen bag with three pockets. And it comes out and the middle one is taken out. And what do you do with it next? You Yep, you break it. Then what do you do with it? You wrap it up in linen and you hide it. You hide it from the children because Passover is to teach the children. You hide it and then you carry on with the service. And then right at the end, at the Afikoman, which is um, Aramaic for like dessert, at the end, you find it again. You send the children to look for it and they find it. So you unwrap it from the linen and then everybody shares it. What did Jesus do? He's broken on the cross. He's wrapped in linen and he's hidden for a time. Then the children of God find him and he is shared to all. The bread, the middle matzah, represents what happens to the resurrection is death burial and resurrection and we could go on and on but that's why we why passover is so important why easter is so worthless because if you only talk about the fact that he was falsely accused nailed to a cross died and were raised again all of those things are true but it misses the fact that god had spent all the centuries laying the foundation so that we could be sure that Jesus wasn't just some nice guy who was falsely accused, nailed and somehow was alive again, that he's really the Messiah that God and his prophets had spoken about from the beginning. But we don't, for all of that, we don't want to forget that what does Jesus want us to do most of all? Does he want us to know just all about what happened to the Israelites? That's about foundation, isn't it? What does he want us to know most urgently today, do you think? You, personally. What do you think Jesus wants you to know? That you can be part of his family if you follow him. Absolutely. The emphasis is salvation. Therefore, the emphasis is on what did Jesus... Now that we can be sure he's really the Messiah, that's the value of understanding Passover from its Hebrew roots. Gives us confidence that we should listen to him. What did we do the other week? What did God say on the mountaintop when Moses and Elijah appeared? This is my son, listen to him. God says it over and over actually. So in Matthew 9, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start to look more closely and what does Jesus say? What does he mean? What should we be hearing for us today? So after that slightly long introduction, let's have Pete, since he's volunteering. Um, if Pete, could you just read our first part of Matthew 9, verses 1 to 8 in the first box there. Jesus stepped into a boat crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sons are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow's blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easy to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God 
who had given such authority to man. Amen. So you've all read that a million times, yeah? Who hasn't heard of Jesus healing the crippled guy and he takes up his mat, goes home? You've all have you done that before? Sure you have. Let's look at it a bit more closely than normal. It says here that he crossed he stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Can anybody tell me without cheating what town would that be? <laughs> He's born in Bethlehem. Why is he born in Bethlehem? Well, firstly, it's prophesied. Bet, in Hebrew means house. Lachem is bread. Bet Lachem is the house of bread. He is, he is the bread of life. Where do you get the bread of life? From the house of bread. Bethlehem. Bethlehem, okay? But he doesn't stay there. First he moves to Nazareth. But it, most of his ministry is based out of the same town as Peter lives in. Which is? Someone's looked ahead. Excellent. Okay. Well, I have to remember how to spell it now. So this, you pronounce it like this. Kapernahum. Kapernahum. Okay. This word in Hebrew is made up of two. The word that gets translated like that, who's heard of Yom Kippur? The Day of Atonement? One of the, one of the autumn holy days, Yom Kippur? This word, Kippur, oh, got to remember how to spell it myself, it is TPs, that's right. Kippur, this means atonement. What is atonement? Can anyone tell me? Remember, re, remember it like this, at one meant. What does Isaiah say your sin does? Isaiah 50 something? Your, it is your sin that has separated you from God. Right? The whole, what salvation really is, is the undoing of that separation. To, to, to make at one those who were separated. You know, that which is separate from God dies. That was in God doesn't. Kippur. Atonement. That's what this first half means. This one, you need to stick an H in it. N-A-H-U-M. Nahum. Who's, if you have a look in your Bible, you see there's a whole book of Nahum. Have you ever read it? Nahum is sent to prophesy against the Assyrians when God has had enough of them. Remember I've mentioned this before, their capital, Nineveh. You can visit it today. It's about five bricks in the dust. That's all that's left of it. God did everything Nahum sent him, uh, sent. Let me get that right. God did to Nineveh everything he sent Nahum to warn them he would. He didn't just destroy the city, he destroyed the entire Assyrian Empire. Who are the Assyrians? They were the ones God used to punish Israel, the ten tribes. But they were wicked and evil, so God wiped them out. But what does Nahum actually mean in Hebrew? Nahum basically means consolation which is a, a flash word for comfort. So when God says, I will comfort my people, I'll bring them consolation, he means he'll bring peace to the distressed. You know, rescue to those who need rescuing. If you put these two words together, what does this town's name mean? It means somewhere where God will bring consolation, comfort through atonement how do you get peace with God who atones for us Jesus when you become a disciple 
you gain God's comfort and consolation in a cruel and evil world through being having your sins atoned for which undoes your separation from God which brings you your peace does peace mean the absence of trouble what does it mean then means the absence of condemnation you'll see in the the world has forgotten the church has forgotten that the scripture says plainly that the world stands condemned already it's not that God is going to condemn the wicked at the end they stand condemned already they ought to be terrified the reason they're not terrified is they, they're unable to comprehend their true state but if you comprehend their true state and your true state apart from Christ, you'll be terrified. You know, eternal eternity in the lake of fire, that doesn't sound like fun. Hence, through atonement, Kippur, you have nahum, comfort. Everything in the story, everything in Matthew 9, is happening in Kippur nahum. A place where God brings peace, comfort, consolation to his people through atonement. Do you think Jesus picked that place by accident? Of course not. <clears throat> Some of your Bibles will translate it. If you look it up, see what it means. It'll, and they'll write the village of Nahum. Who knows how they get that? This word never means village. You can't get village from this. And there's nothing at all in Hebrew history to suggest that Nahum ever lived there. So, yeah, but you see lots of books that say, oh, it means the village of Nahum. No, it doesn't. Not at all. So keep that in mind as we go through the story that God has deliberately caused these things to happen there, in that place. Because God is sending a message. We go on to read in verse 2, Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on it. In this version it says mat. Some of you um, will have Bibles that say bed or indeed couch. But the Greek word actually means a couch or a bed. So it's not a mat, it's a piece of furniture. Okay. Think of them carrying him on a stretcher or on a, you know, on a little kid's bed type of deal. What's important about him being paralyzed? He can't walk. He can't walk. It says he's completely paralyzed. What else can't he do? Anything. It doesn't say so, but he may not even be able to speak. It says he's completely paralyzed. Right? How does he get to Jesus? He's carried. He's carried. Who carries him? His friends. Could he have got to Jesus without them? No. So in other words, in his own strength, he is unable to save himself. Why has God created this? It's a picture of grace. This is a salvation story. Okay. the key person that Jesus is going to help is God has deliberately chosen someone who can do nothing for themselves they can't even come to Jesus by themselves have a look in John, on page 2, John 6 no one can come to me, this is Jesus speaking no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day how many exceptions are there to no one? 0.0. 0. 0.0. 0. 0. <laughs> exactly, absolutely right, even in decimal currency. No one means no one. So Jesus is saying, it is impossible to come to me unless the Father starts it. Remember we're in a wedding contract? 
Can anyone think, thinking in wedding terms, what would that point to? If, if God the Father has to send his servant to draw you to his son, what's that a picture of? Especially in Old Testament Israel. It's the father that makes the choice. That's right. It's the father that chooses the bride for his son. And he sends a servant to get her. So the practical experience for people is they suddenly find themselves having God thoughts and wondering about is this Jesus anything at all for sometimes years before they suddenly realize they can't ignore it and they, then they start to ask somebody or they might go to church for the first time. God himself always starts a genuine salvation. What does that mean for you if you're out doing missions work? If someone sends you out to save people for Jesus, what should you say to them? I think you've confused me with the Father because I can't do that. I can only be his witness. And if there's anyone there who God is already drawing to the Son, they will hear. But you yourself can save no one. <laughs> let's look at back in verse 1 again what happens when these guys bring this crippled guy in it says when Jesus saw their faith he said to the man take heart, take heart son your sins are forgiven isn't that a bit like you all if faith hadn't eaten for a week and she's dying of hunger and you'll carry her over to our place to the kitchen and you're like faith's dying of hunger and I said I see that here's a new t-shirt you'd be thinking what wouldn't you what's that got to do with what's wrong with her well imagine that's going to be the reaction of these friends why have they bought him he's paralyzed Everyone can see that. What does Jesus deal with? He completely ignores, apparently, the fact that he's paralyzed. Have a look what he said. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. What did Jesus just do? He just dealt with what was really wrong. What the guy really needed. It's like Pete being in hospital at the moment with cancer and the doctor's telling him he might not last a month. It's really tempting to really be interceding for his healing and, you know, that he'll live to a hundred and all that stuff. But Pete has what he needs he has salvation he has Christ if God healed him that would be a bonus understand God has dealt with for Pete what matters he always does what does that teach us if we're praying for people or dealing or ministering with people or even ourselves what do you think God will deal with first Whose salvation is he most interested in your life? Yours. But you'll be astonished the number of people that run around doing work for God and praying for everyone else and doing, you know. And all the while, Jesus is waiting for them to slow down and deal with their own life. Because if you've met some missionaries, that's the one life they forget to minister to, is their own. Like any tradesman. Yeah, <laughs> don't buy a mechanic's car <laughs> or a builder's house. It would never be quite but finished, isn't it? God always will bring you to deal with your own stuff first because there's nothing more important to him than your salvation. 
much more important than whether you've got a job or a girlfriend or a house or whatever else that you know. And people sit there praying and praying and praying and praying, thinking that what they need is, oh, the classic, what they need is the girlfriend. What you know? Seek you first, the kingdom. The kingdom. You know? And you think God has not heard that prayer? Of course he has. But what will he do? Well, firstly, he'll always, without exception, press you to deal with what's more important first. On that subject, since so many young people pray for boyfriends or girlfriends, if God was to answer you, huh? if he lo let's take these two over here, our crash test dummies here, so Daryl's praying that God will open Maravik's eyes to see him. I'm here. <laughs> and then God sent Skype, wasn't it? So that she could. I oh, yeah, that's right. But if God loves Maravik and he's thinking, okay, maybe I'll answer that prayer. What's the first thing he's going to do if God loves Maravik? He's going to make Daryl have to deal with Daryl to make sure that Daryl is Christ's disciple because the father ain't giving his daughter to a pagan. Yeah? He's not giving his precious daughter up to someone who's not really a son. He will prioritise. And it works in reverse too before you get too comfortable. You know? <coughs> God will always prioritise you ahead of what you want. Okay? That's what he did here. But you see, it said he responded because he saw their faith. Who's, who is he talking about? Friends. Whose faith? The friends. The faith of the friends, right? Faith in what? Action. It just says their faith. Faith in what? I want you to think about this. Had these friends met Jesus before? Well, we don't know, but there's nothing to suggest it. Why would they have brought their crippled friend to Jesus then? They would have heard something. Because the whole place is buzzing about this guy that lays hands on people and they get well. Right? Do you think that they believe he's the Messiah? Unlikely. They just heard that if someone's sick, you can bring him to this dude here and he'll do something and then next thing they're well. So they love their friend. So what do they do? They cart him on the bed and they bring him. What's their faith in? We don't know. But it's very unlikely to be in Jesus, isn't it? Because they've only just met him, they don't know anything about him, really. So that word faith doesn't mean, in this sentence, doesn't mean belief in the Messiah, faith as we think about in church. What does it mean then? Pete's already told you. In Greek, the word is pistis. Okay, and remember in Greek and Hebrew, there is only one word for faith and faithfulness. God does not separate them. If you say you have faith but you're not faithful, you're dreaming. You don't have faith. You know, if you're faithful but you're not sure about your faith, you're dreaming. You do have faith. The two cannot be separated. What you do faithfully is the evidence of what you have faith in. Didn't James say something about that? Yep. Without, you know, oh, it's other. <laughs> James 3, you look it up. Um, so here, what is the faith, what is the pistis in Greek that Jesus is seeing? They have taken the action consistent with love and hope and trust concerning their friend 
who cannot help himself. It's that faithfulness that Jesus responds to. So what do you think they're expecting? Well, they're hoping this guy, whoever he is, will do something and their friend will be walk again. Huh? Imagine how shocked they are when instead he just wants to deal with his sin. How easy is it to say your sins are forgiven? Just try that now. See if you can manage to say it. Your sins are forgiven. How hard is that? Incredibly simple. You know? So it's easy to say. It doesn't mean much, does it? It's just words. Anyone can say it. It's just words. And he's lying there, and he's paralyzed, and this guy they had all this hope in, he just says, oh, your sins are forgiven. Well, that's like you've been starving and saying, here's a new t-shirt. Everyone's begun to go, what? You know, can't you see she's hungry? What's this t-shirt? What is Jesus doing? We, we know he's going to the priority issue first, right? Now look what he does next. He's in Capernaum. He's talking about your sins are forgiven, right? Your sins are atoned for. That's the name of this place means. This whole story is a salvation story. The guy's problem is not that he's crippled by whatever disease it is. He's crippled by sin. He's a slave to sin. He's not really alive. His life is controlled by sin. Every sin is like that. Every unsaved person is this guy. They may not be lying in a bed unable to walk, but every unsaved person is that guy. In this place where God brings cons consolation and comfort through atonement, what does Jesus do? He tells the guy, your sins are atoned for. Now, how do we know how do we know that God has deliberately allowed this guy to be crippled so that he can prove something. Does God do it anywhere else? Yep. Do you think it's an accident that the guy's there? Of course not. If no one can come to Jesus except the Father draws them, ask yourself, who do you think really bought the friends with the crippled guy? Who brought them there? Whose idea was it? Theirs? They wouldn't have understood it. But it's the Holy Spirit who's working up a testimony for Jesus. Under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, these friends go, let's take him to that guy. Understand? The whole picture is of the guy being brought by someone else to Jesus. Who deals with their sin. Let's have a look in John 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why, is this, why are they saying this man or his parents? Because the Jews, uh, working on the Old Testament, which says that the sins of the father will be visited on the son. That's right. So remember in the Old Covenant, the sins of one generation would flow on, punishment for it would flow on down to the third, even the fourth generation. So they're asking, why is this guy blind? Did he sin or was it his parents or maybe his grandparents? What does Jesus say? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. In other words, his blindness is not because of sin. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, God intended from the beginning that what happens next be seen. As long as it, uh, sorry, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
Still while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The guy is blind, right? What does Jesus, I haven't put it here, but what does Jesus do next? You know what he does next. What does he do? What does he do for the blind guy? He opens his eyes. When his eyes open, what does a blind guy see for the first time? Light. The light allows him to see the light. The physical opening of his eyes is only an external reflection of what's happening in the spirit. Jesus gives him the ability to see the light. To see him. Okay? And Jesus has pointed out here, this man was born for this day so that the rest of you could see it. No accident. Same thing is happening with our guy, crippled guy on the couch. So don't get the idea that if you see someone who's crippled or whatever, oh, it must be a sin problem. Not necessarily. They might have had a car accident. You know? Sin might be involved. If they're a human being, they're a sinner. If they're a sinner, they need salvation whether they're in a wheelchair or, or not, you know. But in this story, the two stories are the, uh, linked like that. In both cases, God has brought that person with their particular problem to show something. In this guy, in the blindness case, the light opened his eyes to be so that he could see the light. What do we say about the crippled guy? He can't walk, right? If he can't walk, he can't follow. can't use his arms if you can't you know he's crippled completely paralyzed can't use your arms or your hands what can't you do you can't serve you can't do and it doesn't say but maybe you couldn't speak because you can see nowhere in the story is there any mention of him saying anything he might have been so paralyzed he might even be able to speak if you can't speak you can't testify so what has sin done in this person? He stopped them being able to ever bear fruit in Christ. He can't do anything useful with his life because sin has paralyzed his life. All right? Let's flip to page three. Verse four back in Matthew 9 knowing their thoughts Jesus said why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts which is easier to say your sins are forgiven well we looked before, a minute ago didn't we that's easy anyone can say that or to say get up and walk and this is the whole purpose in verse 6 but I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins on earth what does that mean now where you are not just in heaven what did just jesus just say to them this whole thing is happening before your eyes for one purpose so that my father will demonstrate to you that i have the authority his authority to forgive your sin here now where you are be, and remember what their surprise is he said instead of saying be healed he says your sins are forgiven you so jesus uses the healing not as the purpose but as the evidence that he has god's authority to forgive the thing he did first does that make sense What do you think the most stunning part of the story is? That the guy was able to get up and walk? Which is, what do you think is the most amazing part of the story? Because we know what happens next. It says, take up your mat, go home. The guy gets up, he's healed. Right? And... And usually in church, that's the part they'll emphasize. Oh, he was able to heal this guy. Missing the whole point. What does Jesus say the main point is? 
Your sins are forgiven you. I'm going to heal you just to demonstrate that when I say your sins are forgiven you, has my Father's authority. Because anyone can say, you all just did it. Anyone can say your sins are forgiven you. How do you know that has any authority? Well, try this. You're crippled. Get up and walk. And by the power of God, he does. You getting this? The point is not to heal his legs. The point is to demonstrate that what he said first has his father's authority. Your sins are really forgiven. But now that he can walk, what can he do now? There's nothing stopping him following now that he can walk. Now that he's got his hands and his arms, there's nothing stopping him serving. Now that he can talk, there's nothing stopping him testifying. That's what the forgiveness of sins does. It takes away what might otherwise stop you being fruitful. That might otherwise stop you being Christ's servant. Because he could have just healed the guy physically, but done nothing about his relationship with God. But remember, they're in Capernaum. Capernaum. The place where God brings about peace through atonement. The whole point of the story. Who do you think got the biggest blessing? Well, it's difficult to know, but my money is on the friends. Probably it's natural to pick the guy who was crippled, now he can walk. But who do you think was blessed most? What part did the guy, crippled guy have in this? Not much. Not much. It's pretty <laughs> passive. Right? Yeah. But the friends, uh, their faithfulness was rewarded by the Lord and their friend was set free. Is there a lesson for us in that? What do you think that would be? I'd say there's at least two things. First of all, if you take action in belief, then you are believing. And the second is, if you were the person who's been healed, you've then got a choice as to whether you can stay in that healing or walk away from it. Uh, yeah, there's truth in that. I want to focus on the friends for a second. How do you think they went home? I mean, it doesn't mention them again. But how do you think they went home? But a bit, you know, a bit down? <laughs> no. <laughs> Wouldn't they be bouncing? Wouldn't they be just about walking on air? Because they have almost a desperate hope, hoping that maybe God is with this guy. And then they've seen that he has God's authority to forgive the sins of their friend and heal him. Their faithfulness has been overtly rewarded before their eyes. The gift is to them. Remember, Jesus does it because of their faithfulness. Right? What does that say for us as disciples today? What, what great joy can you hope for as a Christian in this life? Not the things of the kingdom necessarily because the kingdom is yet to come. But where can you see yourself in this story? If you're a Christian disciple, where could you be in this story tomorrow? You get a lot of joy out of helping other people come to realise the truth. For someone to be saved, for someone to be, for God to intervene in their life and heal them or anything like that, has to start with God, right? No one can come to Him unless the Father draws them. But did God bring this person, did he just like elevate the bed and make it like hover down to Jesus? Could have. You know, nothing stopping God do that. Or he could have just brought Jesus to where the guy was. What did he do? He had the people who had the concern for him carry him to Christ. What do we call that today? Prayers and, Prayers and petitions. It's intercession. 
When you intercede on behalf of someone who can't intercede for themselves because they don't know the Lord or whatever, your intercessory prayers and your practical evangelism, your witness, your testimony, your, when you are bringing them to Christ or bringing Christ to them with your witness, your testimony, the greatest joy you could have is when God answers. And when you see that person's life transform, when, they, when you see that God has forgiven their sins and, and dealt with whatever has crippled them. Do you have to be in some kind of special ministry for that? No. It's, that is the ministry of the whole body and every part of it. So it might be your workmate, your schoolmate, whatever. Just your witness in their life. You can be one of the friends carrying the cripple to Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, it says here, so he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, or more properly, your, your um, bed, and go home. And then the man got up and went home, and the crowd saw this, and they were filled with awe, and they praised the God who had given such authority to man. So God being praised, obviously, is the goal here. But it says he went home. Is God pointing to something here as well? Well, yes, he is. That word for home is oikos. And it doesn't just mean house. So, you know, when you go back to the Philippines, don't you think, oh, we're going home? But you're going to more than one house. Home can be a whole country. Home can be back to family. Home can be many things. The Greek word oikos is the same. Where is home for us? Let's have a look what God, um, Jesus has to say about it. Page 3, bottom, John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I, I, sorry, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So the first thing is, where we are now is not where his father's house is, is it? Because he has to go there to prepare a place for us and come back and get us to take us there. So where's home? Is it here? No. no. Home is where the Father is. Home is where Jesus lives. Home is his place. This picture of the guy being able to get up and walk home, remember this is a salvation story? When your sins are forgiven, and your paralysis ends, you are able to get up and start walking where? Home. If you're a disciple, where is your walk taking you? Home. What's at the end of your walk if you're really his disciple? Heaven, the kingdom, home. See that? That's what this guy is meant to teach us the authority of Jesus to forgive your sins unbinds you. You're no longer crippled like the unbelievers. You have the ability to get up and follow, to get up and walk, to get up and head home. Home is where he is. The crippled guy stands for all of us. All of us, before we were saved. And again in John 17 on the last page, Jesus praying for his disciples. I'm coming to you now, his father is talking about. But I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. That's a bit of a mouthful. What's Jesus saying to the Father? Don't take his disciples out of the world. Protect them in it. But and he says that is needed because we are strangers here. We are not of the world. If you're a disciple, you don't belong to the world. You are at odds with it. You don't fit in. You know? And the world will not like you because you don't fit in. In. you don't want to do it their way you don't want you know so Jesus says don't take them away from here yet why he answers that at the end just as you sent me into the world I am sending them there's business to be done you know and in the course of doing that business you'll be sharpened you'll be changed you'll be sanctified you know so it's a two-way street not only what God will have you do for him but what that whole experience will do to you to transform you to make you fit for to be the bride of Christ but either way you see home is not here we're not home that's why we need protection we're in enemy territory but we're on the way if you listen to lots of the old hymns from the 1800s you'll find that the lyrics all reflect that you know that we are marching to heaven we are you know that all lots of the lyrics have that theme that we are travelers on the way where the modern church has come unglued is that they have been teaching that the kingdom is already here that this is it well, i don't know about you but have a look outside I, if that's heaven well you know god hasn't done a very good job is he <laughs> it's a bit of a mess so obviously the kingdom is not here. So, who was the message for God from God for that day? Well, maybe it was for the Pharisees who were watching. Remember? They were all negative, saying, Oh, who do you think you are? What did God show them? This is my son. Listen to him. Because he said, you know, anyone can say your sins are forgiven. There, I said it again, easy. But try this, take up your mat, go home. They would have been like, <clears throat> you know? That would have been shocking to the Pharisees because how do you deal with that? You know? How about the crippled man? Do you think it was for him? Of course it was he yeah he's not to be overlooked obviously he was blessed and that although this was for a wider purpose a bigger purpose even up to today the man himself was plainly blessed his life would never have been the same again it doesn't say if he became a disciple but you'd have to wonder how you could avoid being a disciple after that yeah And as I said here, my vote is that mostly it was for the friends. Because when God rewarded their faithfulness, do you think their lives would ever be the same again? Who's been on Christian mission? Anyone done like anything sort of mission work? Well, I can tell you, your life is permanently transformed when you see God use you and you see God move there's nothing like it you can never go back you can never have a normal life after that you know never because you, you'd have to pretend that it didn't happen when it, you know what I mean I'll leave the rest there so what's it telling us the name keep this in mind where did god choose to do it in a place which means i'm going to bring you
consolation, comfort, through atonement. How? My son has my authority to forgive your sins here. And the immediate effect is though you were crippled by sin before, you will have the ability to get up and walk home. And you have your arms back in your mouth, so you'll have the ability to testify and to do on the way home. That makes sense. And what should we take from it going forward? Well, if we're really his disciples, should we be having a passive discipleship? Should we get should we carry that bed home to our house and then lie back down on it? Because lots of people do. Lots of people go and they listen to the sermon. Yep, yep, yep. Go home. File that away. Straight back to naughty land. They do nothing with their faith. Nothing. We are forgiven so that we will walk. So that we will head home. God is not doing all this for his, just for some strange, obscure entertainment. It's for us. Also remember, no matter what you're praying, you will not be able to convince God to prioritise it over your own salvation. Yeah? So never neglect to ask God to show you what he wants you to do about your walk. Your, you know, He won't forget what you're also petitioning, but he will never agree to prioritise something else over your own life. And remember, you can be that friend, even for a complete cripple, who's not praying for themselves, who's not praying at all. Maybe they're a complete unbeliever. Maybe they're a total pagan. Maybe they're your worst enemy. You know? But if, if God calls them, they may need help to come. Won't be afraid to help them pick up their bed and get there. Does that make sense? Incidentally, it's friends plural. God almost never works, almost never works through individuals. Occasionally, but for the most part, how does God work? At least two. Remember when he sent the disciples out? He, he gave them power and authority and he sent them out in pairs. And you all know the answer. Why? Why? Because nothing is established by less than two witnesses. Okay? The Hebrews they were sent to would not believe one man coming with a story. Two. So we are supposed to function as a body Whereas a church at large, certainly like for me, being in the Sallies and that, you know the mo what happens? You get the idea that certain people are called to ministry and others aren't. So all the doing, the expectation is those who have some sort of badge. You know, you're the youth worker, so anything to do with youth, you'll do that. You're the music team leader, so you can do the music, you'll do that. Me, what do I do? Well, I come on Sunday, I'm the seat filler. That's what my badge says. I fill the seat. I'm really good at it. And that's the mentality that they give people, as if there's two kinds of Christians. Some sort of ministers and some sort of observers, an audience. No. What does it say in the scripture about the body of Christ? It has many parts. What does it say about the parts? All of them are essential. That if any one of them is injured, the whole body is sick. There are no you know, passenger parts in the body. 
There's no observer role. All the parts have a place. All the parts have a role. So if your sins have been forgiven, what should you be doing? Lying back down on your bed? No. Get up and walk. Your walk will be different from someone else's because you're a different part of the body than someone else. So don't try and be like someone else. Learn what God, take the opportunities God puts in front of you. Use the gifts God's given you. And never make the mistake of thinking that God can't use you because you're not like that other guy or that other girl or whatever. Who's read much of the Old Testament? Yeah? Who does God always choose? Prophets, all these things. Who does he invariably choose? Who did, he, who did he choose to get rid of Goliath? David. The other giant? What's special about David? Nothing. He's scrawny. All his brothers are big. He's little. He's f no, one is, no one even thinks of him because he's the runt. You know? Even Israel itself, among the nations, was the... The runt, the little one. God always chooses the weak, the foolish, the tiny, to confound the wise. Why? Because they look on and saying, how could you do that? And the answer is, well, I didn't. God did it through me. So no one has any excuse. God can use you all, will use you all. <laughs> What's your song, Johan? Ba -ba -ba. Okay. Ba-ba-ba, <laughs> yeah. So we'll, end, <coughs> so we'll end that there, Reverend, Reverend. Good evening, Reverend. Yeah. Any questions? What I want you to, what I want you to grasp also is, I'm pretty sure you will have all read that scripture many times, countless times. Do you understand how about slowing down a bit and looking into the meaning of the words and things doesn't change what it says, but you see how much you miss when you just just over it? And you can easily be mistaken for thinking that the story is just about a guy who was crippled and now he can walk. Well, that's true, but that's not the story. You know? It's not the message, should I say. At the end, one last thing. It's on that exact subject. If you're in especially Pentecostal churches who believe in the gifts of the Spirit and all the rest, which are real, you get this unfortunate thing that they assume that what's important is that the sick person gets well or that the crippled person can walk. You know? Or that the unemployed person gets a job. They think that that is what God would give the power of the Holy Spirit to do. What have any of those got to do with eternity? Nothing. Do you think crippled people don't go to heaven if they're his disciples? Do you think a blind disciple won't go to heaven because they're still blind? Or an unemployed disciple won't go to heaven because they still don't have a job? None of those things mean a bean. And what happens in those places is people get so fixated on the physical stuff that they completely forget to pray about what actually matters. They completely forget about God's priority and they stop teaching about repentance, they stop teaching about obedience, they stop teaching about discipleship, and they spend all of their meetings shouting it in Jesus' name this and in Jesus' name that. You know, trying to get stuff that isn't on God's priority list. It's not that he couldn't do it. It's that he's like this. When are you going to remember me? Instead of just use my name to get what you want. When are you going to remember why I hung on a cross? Instead of thinking that that doesn't mean much, what matters is that I get a new car. Whatever it is you're praying for. 
Understand? That's the way the church and the world are going, not us. If you ask the Lord for direction how to pray, you might be surprised where he sends you. Yeah? Okay. On that we will finish. On the 30th, so 24th, remember we're going to... Whose house is it actually? Mark's, Mark and Tracy's house. Mark and Tracy. Good old Mark and Tracy. I can't tell you who they are, but I'm sure they'll be great. So we're going to their place to share a meal for Passover. That's in Upper Hut Way. So, th so there'll be nothing on the Saturday, but the Sunday. What time is it again? Uh, five something, isn't it? Really is it? Oh, anyway. Five, I don't know. It's on the email. Sunday evening, anyway. Yeah. Oh, we'll confirm. So that's what we do on the 24th. But on the 30th, I have to be on a film set. So, that's heaps of time, eh? For... If anybody wants to come to the, the camp on that weekend, they can. I don't know if they will want to. Yeah, but that won't be everyone knows anything. What I was hoping is, hoping out loud, maybe you guys could bring something on the 30th like you've done before. Just share it, you know? Like pick a, pick a topic out of the gospel, a subject, and just, you know, share. How about that? Because it's really important that it's not just all about me talking. Because I'm not special, you know. Deal? Yes? No? No, no, no. You work it out. Um, you could either nominate someone between you, but that, but, <laughs> but uh, to be honest with you, it's probably, it's probably more helpful, both to those listening and those doing it, that you share the load a bit. And it doesn't have to be in this format. You know? Whatever. Do a PowerPoint, make a video, whatever you want to do. I, it's, you know. But, but just pick a, pick a subject from the gospel, a topic. Try and make it something that challenges you preparing it and challenges those who are hearing it. So you might just decide what would that be? You know? You could get something like, what does it mean when it says, obey your parents? Wives, submit to your husbands. Simple topics like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Those are complicated topics. Okay. I'm just kidding, they're complicated topics. But pick something, pick something that's a bit challenging, so that it's not boring, so you're not just thinking, oh yeah, you know. Pick something that you can think, right. challenging. Challenging, yeah. Yeah. And what you do is you look at Mary Lou, and if she's going like that, you'll know you're on the money. You know? Because you've got her attention. Ooh. Okay. Let's finish with prayer. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the deliberate testimony you've made that day, which still speaks to us today. We ask and pray, Lord, that if, if any of us are really cripples on the couch, Lord, that you would forgive our sins and allow us to get up and walk and to do and to speak and to testify. That you would guide us on the way home. And we ask you, Lord, to give us opportunity and, and everything we need to be able to bring cripples to you those you're bringing to yourself lord enable us to help you bring them enable us to help them come in whatever way lord that you are willing to empower us to give us a testimony lord for the sake of others we ask you lord to constantly show yourself through us and to us and in us that in everything lord your word that we've shared not be for nothing that your witness and testimony not return to you empty-handed, Lord, but that you would accomplish in us and through us everything you intended from the beginning. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would keep us safe, that you would deliver us from our many spiritual enemies in the world, that you would bring us back together again safely, Lord, full of joy and full of testimony. 
about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of Yeshua, and the certainty, Lord, that we have in you, that home is worth walking to for all the trouble on the way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.